I've been speaking to people um, remotely because I work remotely, um, and it, I've been able to speak to people perhaps more deeply than I would have done if I'd have just been a chance encounter in an office because a lot of it's one to one. So you get to know people better. You get to know the issues they're facing, the problems, which a lot of which are the same that I am. But then some, occasionally you get to know a little bit more about some of the things that people are struggling with personally. And um, some, of, some of those things, you know, people perhaps are, 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 are trying to explore whether you, you've got a, an answer to something or a way of approaching something. And, and certainly with some of the um, issues that some of the people I've been talking to have been experiencing, it's, it's allowed me to bring my faith into how I cope with situations. And, it, you know, some people it's just water off a duck's back, but some people really seem to be interested. I always try and um, let people know that I'm a Christian. Um, just because I want them to connect anything that good that they see in me with with Christ. I don't want to be known particularly as a nice person for any anything good that I do. But also I want to be someone at work who um, can see when I've done, can own up to not being the person that I should be, you know, when it's when I've not treated someone the way that I should, or when I've not, you know, the work that I've done has not been up to the standard, it's not been good enough. Um, so I want people to be able to connect things that they see in the way that I work with the gospel. I work in the city and um, there are a lot of challenges working in the city, the environment, the career, the scary bosses, um, you know, the kind of rat race, climbing up the career ladder, um, saying the right thing, you know, what's the right thing? Did I say the wrong thing? What will they think of me? Um, and knowing that the Lord is sovereign of everything and has placed me in this job and he can easily, you know, take me out of it, give me another job and that he is in control of my bosses as well. It just gives me the boldness to speak for him and live for him in the workplace. Only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. The famous words of C.D. Studd, who gave up everything for the overseas mission field of China. But we all have only one life. Do you ever feel you're wasting it? If you were a really keen Christian, you'd be a church worker or an overseas missionary. Where does regular work fit into God's purposes? When Jesus began his three-year public teaching ministry at the age of about 30, people in his hometown said, is not this the carpenter? Mark chapter 6 verse 3. Now, we don't know much about those first 30 years, but we do know this, that Jesus did a regular job. He worked as a carpenter for many years. In this session, we're going to reflect on five biblical facts about work and imagine how they would have affected Jesus in his work. And if you find this sort of thing helpful, they all begin with G. The first Bible fact we're going to look at is how work is a gift. Work first appears in the Bible in Genesis chapter two. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So work was part of the original good creation before the fall. It is a good gift. God had told humanity in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 to rule over the world. How was humanity to exercise that rule? Well, in part through the work of having families and working the ground. So the way God set up the world, work was required for things to function. So God gives us our daily bread, but Nothing is going to pop up in the toaster in the morning without the hard work of the farmer, the baker, and the team at Tesco's. So work was part of what we were created to do, whether the work of raising a family at home or regular work outside the home, 
be it paid or unpaid. So when we do our different jobs, we're not wasting our lives. We're doing what God created us to do. It's part of how we are to serve and worship him. You see, the Hebrew word for work also means worship. If you discovered the Lord was going to return next month, would you go to work next week? Well, assuming your work is not illegal or immoral, then it is part of God's will for you. You serve him with your work, not just when you volunteer for Sunday school. And you don't need to be in the caring professions for it to count. Society needs plumbers and bankers just as much as nurses and teachers. Remember what Colossians chapter 3 verse 24 says to Christian slaves, you are serving the Lord Christ. And so when the Son of God became man, he got a regular manual labouring job. The first Adam was a gardener, the last Adam a carpenter. Now, was Jesus treading water for all those years? Could his time have been better spent? Well, no, he was fulfilling all righteousness, living the perfect life, serving his Father and doing his job for him. So give thanks to God for your gift of work each day and do your work for the Lord as part of your service to him. The next fact we're going to look at is how work is not God. The first of the Ten Commandments says this. You shall have no other gods before me. There's only one God and work is not it. The Lord alone is God. Anything else we put in the centre circle of our lives, it takes his place, and we mustn't do that. We must never let a good thing become a God thing. That's idolatry. And 1 John chapter 5, verse 21 urges us to keep ourselves from idols. Work is not designed to be the source of our ultimate security and identity and meaning. And it's one of the reasons why a good work-life balance is so important we need rest, and it's a statement that there's more to life than work. But believing this and living it out is challenging in a culture in which many see work as everything. Marissa Mayer, the former chief exec of Yahoo, she said in an interview that working 130 hours a week was possible if she said you're strategic about when you sleep, when you shower, and how often you go to the bathroom. The Christian has to stand up to this idolatry of work and say, no, work is a gift, but it's not my God. The Lord alone is God. So I'll work hard, but there is more to my life than this. God doesn't just call me to serve him in the workplace, but also in the home, in my personal life, in my church, and they all matter. Jesus did his job as a carpenter. He served his heavenly father. He earned money to support himself and the wider family, but Work was not his God. In his work, he wouldn't have been driven by love of money or the desire to prove himself. He was driven by love of the Father and a desire to serve him. So it's worth asking, do I have a, a healthy work-life balance? Are there signs that work has become my God? Is my identity in Christ or in my work and my performance there? Third fact, Work is a grind. The work is everything party. They would have you leap out of bed at the start of a new working week screaming, thank God it's Monday. Well, that may have been true for Adam in the Garden of Eden before the fall, but the world has changed. In Genesis 3, work falls under God's judgment on sin. The work of the home, bearing and raising kids, and the work of the ground, they both become painful. Death also enters the world, creating a sense of futility in work. In Genesis 4, we have the first example of envy, hatred and violence at work. Cain kills Abel in the workplace, in the field. In Genesis 31, Jacob sums up his 20 years work experience in harsh conditions amidst unfair treatment by his employer Laban. He says, by day the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. You have changed my wages ten times. And in Genesis chapter 39, we have the first case of sexual harassment in the workplace. 
Joseph finds his boss's wife trying to seduce him and he resists her, but she makes a false accusation. He is subject to unfair dismissal, he's wrongfully imprisoned, and there's no union, there's no HR department to defend him. Work is really hard for many people today. They're poorly paid, it's boring, awful conditions. I mean, think of sewer workers in India, cleaning out sewers by hand without protective gear, for peanuts, exploited, many fatalities, and many of them are Christian. Now, in any job, you have pressure and frustration. You have to deal with the sins of the heart spilling over into workplace relationships, coveting, envy, slander, gossip, pride. It makes work a grind. Now, this would have been true for Jesus as well, that he would have had to deal with difficult customers, maybe an unreasonable boss, perhaps nasty co-workers, long hours, tiredness, things going wrong, pressure, order deadlines, and too much work. He would have needed to rely on his Heavenly Father in prayer and learn perseverance as we do. In a fallen world, at times work is going to feel a grind. Hard, frustrating, boring, exhausting, stressful. Don't feel guilty when that's your experience, as if you're doing something wrong. We need to be realistic, to pray for perseverance and to support one another. Fourth Bible fact about work, work is a godliness challenge. In the letter to the Colossians, Christian slaves are told how to behave in their work. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. There's a well-known cartoon that shows a boss asking an employee, why aren't you working? And the employee replies, I didn't see you coming. The people pleaser does things to be seen, to get credit when the boss is watching. By contrast, serving the Lord means to work with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. This means being conscientious, knowing that, if I can put it like this, our invisible manager in heaven is always watching. And so Jesus would have been conscientious, worked hard, didn't do a shoddy job. I bet his tables and chairs were well made. Galatians chapter 5 famously lists the fruit of the Spirit. Our ambition should be to display this fruit in the place we do our work, to exemplify the fruit of godly character and good works. Imagine how Jesus would have behaved in his carpenter's workshop. Being kind, loving, patient, self-controlled, not flying off the handle when things went wrong, not blaming others, not gossiping, not flirting. Godliness includes doing our work as for the Lord. However boring or pointless a task may be, if you do it for the Lord, it becomes significant and you can put your heart into it. So next time you're faced with a dull to-do list, why not write for the Lord next to the worst item? and do it for him. It changes everything. And finally, work is a gospel opportunity. No matter what work we do, our work is an opportunity to share the good news with others. With the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, a new type of work entered human history, and the Bible calls it the work of the Lord in a number of places. It is the work of making disciples of Jesus Christ, as the good news about him is proclaimed. Now this work is unlike any other work on the planet in that it has eternal consequences. So through it people come to know God and are rescued from hell for heaven. No other work can do that. God's plan is that some Christians like myself are paid to do this work as their job or vocation, but all Christians are to be committed to this and that includes in our regular place of work. Listen to these verses from the New Testament. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. And Christians subject to earthly masters are urged to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way, 
they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. Our behaviour at work will either underline or undermine the gospel. But living the life and being known as a Christian is not enough. In the end, people need to hear the message about Jesus. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul prays that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. Well, that is a good workplace prayer, that at appropriate times and places, God would open a door for the message and that we would have the courage to walk through. God determines where we live, where we work and who we work with. And he has given you a unique set of workplace relationships. Even if you hate your work and you find your colleagues difficult, be encouraged that God has chosen to put you there to fulfill his purpose. As a Christian, the best chance your colleagues have of hearing the gospel is probably through you. If you have a typical job, then you're with them five days a week throughout the day. By contrast, they probably hardly know their next door neighbours where they live. So make the most of the opportunity. And pray for your work colleagues by name. Build good relationships with them and take genuine interest in them. In love, look for opportunities to share the good news of God's grace with others at work. Chatting over lunch or a coffee, perhaps giving them some good books, maybe a link to a talk, or offering to read the word one-to-one -one with them. After all, I think Jesus would have done that. I don't think he only began to have the sort of conversation he had with the woman at the well in John chapter 4 when he started his public ministry. Given what we've seen in the Bible today, I take it that this was, it was just his way of operating throughout his working life, out of love for his heavenly father and out of love for others. So in summary, five G's from the Bible about work. Work is a gift, work is not God, work is a grind, work is a godliness challenge, and work is a gospel opportunity. If we want a model of living for God in the workplace, let's look to Jesus, Saviour, Lord, and Carpenter. Carpenter.